Stefan. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you this year's Royal Air Force Typhoon display. Here's Johnny! Johnny hesitates as he rolls the jet nearly upside down before pushing the jet around the corner in an outside turn.
Ladies and gentlemen, good on your way. French-built design. 
Then we have a truly outstanding replica built by the Vintage Aviator Limited in New Zealand. This of the Royal Aircraft Factory B2E. And this aircraft provided to us by the World War One Aviation Heritage Trust. Indeed so. And then the third of the trio, the unmistakable Bristol F2B fighter, the Bristit. This is an original from the Shuttleworth collection at Old Warden. Smaller than the other. This brought with it certain structural disadvantages in terms of vigorous air combat. But the Newport 17 was still an excellent fighter. It had a good top speed, favourable rate of climb. And it was agile. It was introduced by France's Aeronautique Militaire. And at that time, it was well able to take on the likes of the Fokker E3, the Eindecker, that was the dominant German fighter at that period of the First World War. And these UPAs were flown by numerous French and British ace pilots of the First World War. Plus the famous U.S. manned Escadrille Lafayette. This replica appears in those markings, but also taking centre stage now in the lead, the B-2E, followed by the Bristol F-2B fighter. B-2s were based here at Duxford with one of the training units that was stationed here early in the RAF's history. That's in the form of number 35 training depot station, stationed here from September 1918 until April 1920. The BE2 family, BE standing for Blario Experimental, was constructed for stability in the reconnaissance role. This perhaps rendered the aircraft in its various versions a little vulnerable, not least to ground fire. But it remained a very effective weapon. It was developed through successive variants and saw myriad roles in the air combat of the Great War. This is the B-2E, which entered service like the Newport in 1916. The proceed of it was slightly disappointing and the first use of it indeed being disastrous. That was during the Avaz offensive of spring 1917. But the tactics changed, at least to make better use of the rear gunner in the two-seat aircraft. And then along came the F-2B with its standard engine, the wonderful Rolls-Royce Falcon. <laughs> the lethal brisket ace of the war was a Canadian pilot, Andrew McKeever. He shot down 31 enemy aircraft while serving with number 11 squadron. Over 1,500 of these machines were in Royal Air Force service by the end of World War One. F and saw use with number 208 squadron, based in Turkey in 1923. Later it was uh, sold onto the civilian market and stored, not to be flown again until the Shuttleworth collection uh, restored, had it restored by the Bristol Aircraft Company, its original manufacturer, and it's been airworthy for over 60 years, virtually. The first of the trio to land then, the Newport 17 Scout, owned and flown by Rob Gould Galliers and based here at Duxford, pilots that appeared a number of years ago. off towards the flight line as in over the threshold at the western end comes the BE-2E from the World War I Aviation Heritage Trust. One of two such aircraft, both built by the Vintage Aviator Limited. Please see that trio. Again, you can see just angling off its approach so as to land as much as possible into wind. Yes, the Staggerwing, the Travel Air Type R, the Mystery Ship, and the Spartan 7W Executive.
richting is een beetje moeilijk. Sleek aircraft for its day. The first prototype actually had a fixed undercarriage, but uh, obviously on later models this was changed to a retractable one. The aim was for a range of a thousand miles and a top speed of 200 miles an hour plus. It had five seats, including that for the pilot plus luggage space. The cost, well, that was in base model form from $14,000 initially. Given that the uh, in the U.S. in 1933 was somewhere around $6,000. You can see that buying one of these aircraft was not a cheap proposition. But the two aircraft about to fly past again had superb performance for its day, and they often competed in transcontinental Bendix trophy races across the U.S. <laughs> National air races of that year in Cleveland, and it caused quite a sensation when it did so. Its top speed was some 235 miles an hour, and that was equivalent to one of the main US fighters of the 1930s, the Boeing P 26, the P shooter. An aircraft of similarly close coupled configuration. 
already seen its first brew some three years later. As part of those 1929 national air races, was staged the inaugural Thompson Cup. The unlimited free-for-all speed contest of that event. And the first example of the mystery ship was flown by Doug Davis. And despite the fact that he had to circle an extra time around a pylon he cut inside on the course, he won at an average speed of 195 miles an hour. That same year, gladiators of number 263 squadron and the Royal Norwegian Air Force were involved in attempts to defend Norway against the German invasion. That too proved to be a harrowing experience. The squadron's aircraft arrived in theatre aboard HMS Glorious in April. After a few days, 
They were evacuated only to return. They would go on to claim 26 of the Buffer kills. On the ship's evacuation in early June 1940, Glorious was sunk with the loss of all 10 surviving gladiators of 263 Squadron and 8 of its pilots. Of course, gladiators saw extensive use in other theatres, Greece, North Africa, East Africa, the Middle East and Malta. defense of the island being put up in 1940 by a flight of fleet air armed sea gladiators both by Royal Navy and RAF pilots from Hell Park and Finland and Sweden used them successfully and there we see the change of era is typified as the Hurricane 12 of the historic aircraft collection takes off under the Gladiator. This is the Shuttleworth Collection's example, which was the last production Mark 1, built in 1937. Its marking was those of another 73 squadron aircraft, which was flown at one of the 1937, one of the 1930s RAF Hendon displays. Thank you. 
only have half since then. So this was a public flying date. We have half now downwind to land. The gladiator which was flown by the VAE Systems Test Pilot Paul Stone, having already landed. Paul well, made his first flight with a couple of collections. We have a little VHPK comic racer yesterday at Old Warden. En als je dan nog een keer hoort, je kunt dat blenden links horen. Als je bezig bent, kan je dat omhaaien. En er is een reden die van een evenement komt, zo. Ja, dat is goed, dat hebben we net, hè. Dat is voor wat might be described as one of the formations of the day, coming up shortly in the programme. We've also got 12. Thank you. 
2003, the Blenheim is now back in flight. In from the left, it runs with the two Spitfires. Great interwar advances in aircraft technology. 
made airline services across the US immediately faster and more profitable. The first military version was a VIP transport, the C-41, but its expansion into other roles was inevitable, and to the US Army Air Force it was called the C-47 Skytrain, or also the C-53 Skytrooper, a variant optimized for the dropping of paratroops. To the British Commonwealth forces, it was the Dakota. <laughs> Meteor 
speciaal, hè? Hij doet altijd naar het licht. Maar hij doet het doen. That's the way to keep it coming. That's the way to keep it coming. Meteor coming in to land. I mentioned that it's impossible with this trainer version to do pilot training, and the man at the controls today is the of Neil Williams and Peter Phillips in particular. It's a former winner, this aircraft, of the King's Cup Air Race in 1964 when it was flown by Dennis Hartus, and it won that year's British Air Racing Championship. Even though it was far from designed for aerobatics, it's always been a very good aerobatic performer, as we're seeing. And in 1964, Neil Williams flew it at that year's World Aerobatic Championships in Bilbao, where he performed well, even though it wasn't the most suitable airframe. Formula One air racing enjoyed a bit of a revival in Britain in the 1970s, and it took part then before being sold to its present owner, Pete Kinsey, in 1984. When you see the cosmic wind going through its paces in front of us, just bear in mind that its Continental O200 engine gives it just 100 horsepower. small aircraft in the British Isles. It must still be up there today. Ah, and they're a beautiful eight-point hesitation roll. Whether you could call the Beaver exhilarating is open to question, but it was certainly an aircraft in which you could have it here. It's owned by the Aircraft Restoration Company, it's an ex-Army Air Corps example that was disposed of by the Ministry of Defence, acquired by ARC, and their restoration has seen it turned into a far more luxurious machine than ever was the case in the Beaver's Army heyday. It's got new avionics, a luxurious rear cabin, and even, I believe, a music system on board for in-flight entertainment for its occupant support to other RAF units. They were also key to the operations of the Air Training Corps, the civilian organisation that ferried aircraft from storage or manufacturers to squadrons. Here they come from the left, a very attractive pairing of the Dragon Rapide and the Anson. This one dates from 1941. 
It was built as a Dominique One at the Haviland Hackfield plant, serving initially with number one camouflage flight, Hendon, today the home of the RAF Museum London. In the latter part of 1943, it was put back onto the Civil Register, transferred to an organisation known as the Associated Airways Joint Committee, and assigned to the Northern Division of Scottish Airways, who used it for scheduled services and ambulance flights. And it would have carried many diverse passengers during its operations up there in the Highlands and Islands. The camouflage was applied as, in effect, wartime regulation colours for civil aircraft with the red, white and blue identifying stripes below the civil registration. And its regular route took it over the top secret at the time, naval base at Scarpa Flow. Reconnaissance land plane for RAF Coastal Command. It was the Royal Air Force's first monoplane to have a retractable undercarriage. And the first ones indeed went to Coastal Command in 1936. <laughs> Bomber Command even took some on as an interim measure before definitive bomber types became available, and 26 squadrons in those two commands had Ansons when war broke out. Soon, aircraft like the Lockheed Hudson and the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley rendered the Anson obsolete on the front line, but in terms of training all the members of an RAF bomber crew, it was hugely important in the training role. <laughs> What we see here is actually a post-war mark, an Anson T-21 trainer. The voice of the late Lady Rosemary Ducrow, one of the Air Transport Auxiliary's 166 female pilots who served during the Second World War. ensuring the preservation of a range of very significant British aircraft. You can see a Mark I Anson, the example that was in service at the outbreak of World War II, in the airspace building amongst IWM Duxford's collection of significant British and Commonwealth aeroplanes. Mark Miller rolling out first then in the Dragon Repeat. And landing behind him, Ben Cox in the Anson. But now, it's time to hand over. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the 270 degree wing over. Thank you. 
the ground. This formation was used extensively on operations in Afghanistan. All of the team today have operational experience from Afghanistan. Captain Jim Trahan and Royal Officer Folks have both deployed on four operational tours of Afghanistan and have spent nearly two years deployed there. Royal Officer Nash and Sergeant Luck both have two years and nearly a uh, year deployed. Ship one on the far left is now positioning for a simulated diving fire rocket attack. In addition to its contribution to operations in Afghanistan, four British Apaches were deployed to the Mediterranean Sea aboard HMS Ocean in 2011. They attacked numerous targets in Libya as part of the UN operation there, proving the Apaches' maritime capability. The Apache pair will now perform a bunt in the centre of the airfield. This manoeuvres 10 tonne to helicopter all the way through its pitch limits from 90 degrees nose up to 90 degrees nose down. The bump bit.
2 variant, built by General Winters, into the scene. Thank you. 
Pacific War, the Corsair, quite apart from its air-to-air -air prowess, found another very important role with the US Navy and Marine Corps, that of a fighter bomber. And as such, they supported numerous important amphibious landings, including in the crucial battles of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Vought was the aircraft's main manufacturer. Vought built Corsairs known as F4Us. This is a Goodyear produced aircraft. That's an FG1D. near Tokyo. This aircraft from the fighter collection is indeed in fleet air arm colours, those of 1850 squadron circa late 1945, serving in the Pacific theatre aboard HMS Vengeance. So we're all done in us, the only one way to describe it. were devastating. 450,000 British lives were being lost. The nations and societies worldwide were affected, and it's important to remember them, as we do today with this formation involving some of the most significant Allied aircraft of World War II.
Side view. The black and yellow checkered engine cowling on one of Sally B's four Wright Cyclone engines. That in memory of the late Ted White, the aircraft to the man who brought this aircraft to Britain in 1975. He lost his life, and since then, Ali Saling Bow has fought on to keep the B 17 airworthy. And this they've always managed right up to this very auspicious 40th anniversary year. It received no official support. And that the aircraft keeps flying is down to not least the members of the Sally B Supporters Club. They're members all around the world dedicated 
Cubs of Eton team up with Eden to be their supporters club, who will help keep this aircraft flying for 40 years. Sally B touches gently down 